So in today's lectures, uh, we will study medical statistics uh, and in particular survival analysis. Uh, I will assume in this lecture that you are already familiar with, uh, uh, with descriptive uh, statistics uh, and with uh, uh, hypothesis testing. Um, if this is not the case, because I realize that sometimes uh, uh, your knowledge of statistics is lower than I expect, uh, uh, please let me know and we can also add another lecture, at least, uh, you know, to upload it, uh, to make sure that you can catch up with the most important concepts in, uh, uh, in descriptive statistics and in uh, hypothesis testing. This lecture, per se, as I say, will focus on survival analysis. This is uh, uh, one of the first examples of survival analysis, the general population survival, by Christian Huygens, the famous scientist of the <clears throat> 17th century, very famous especially for uh, optics, that showed uh, the, how was the survival curve in 1669, I mean, how the uh, percentage of uh, uh, the population that could reach, uh, uh, in that case, 86, 86 years as a function of the uh, age, let's say. So survival analysis is a method for analyzing longitudinal data uh, on the occurrence of events. Uh, events may include death, of course, but also injury, onset of illness, recovery from illness, which is more like a, a binary, uh, which are all binary variables. Now let's say death, yes or no, injury, yes or no, and so on and so forth but also transition above or below a clinical threshold or a meaningful continuous variable. For example, the, the, the CD4 counts that gives you the biomarker. It also accommodates data from randomized clinical trial or cohort uh, uh, study design. So eventually all clinical trials or cohort studies uh, end up in uh, a, a survival analysis, which not necessarily means death, but uh, is always called survival analysis. So uh, the survival analysis is based on the concept of time to event. Time to event data are generated when the measure of interest is the amount of time to occurrence of an event of interest, which in our case for the typical survival will be the amount of time from the treatment to the death of the patient. But you see, there are many, 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 uh, many examples, you know, because it can be time from randomization to death in a clinical trial, time from HIV, uh, from HIV infection to IDS expression, depends on which kind of survival you are you are uh, you are uh, talking uh, about or time from exposure to cancer incidents uh, uh, time from exposure to some some pollutant to cancer incidents in an epidemiological cohort study now a concept which is probably new for you in uh, survival analysis but is very important is the concept of censoring uh, the, 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 the censoring is when we lose uh, the exact time to event measure. And this typically is when uh, um, um, the patients that are enrolled in a clinical trial, so they will undergo the treatment as uh, uh, designed in the clinical trial, uh, they, are, um, they are followed up until the, until the event of interest, of course. But censoring may occur, and generally this is because either a person does not experience the event before the study ends, so, you know, is there and, uh, and uh, is still alive, for example, you know, or death due to a cause not considered to be a, an event of interest. For example, he's enrolled in a trial on, uh, in a clinical trial on cancer treatments, uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but then going to the hospital, he has a car accident and he dies because of the car accident. Of course, this is uh, the, 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 the death patient has to be censored, you know, because his death is unrelated to, to the trial. Or simply, the, which is also the most common cause, uh, is the loss to follow up. So these are patients that do not show up uh, um, at the follow-up, uh, so you lose track of the patients. For example, they 
move to another city or simply they don't want to report anymore to that hospital. So that patient is lost and then is censored. Uh, uh, these are uh, 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 examples of right censoring, which is the most common form of censoring. Uh, the, um, the complete time to event measure is then unknown. And we only know that the true time to event measure is greater than the observed measure. So when we censor a patient, this means that uh, something can happen later of the, of the point where, where I censor that, that patient. Uh, so these are, these are examples, you see. So these are, um, the X here means an event occurred and the O means uh, that the subject was censored. So you will see, the, actually you will see the crosses when the patients are censored, but this is to give you an idea. This is the time to the event. You see patients can also be enrolled uh, at different times, uh, not necessarily all together, but eventually you, you can censor you can censor the, the, the patient or the, or the event occur, and then you can renormalize everything to the time zero <coughs> so that every patient is normalized. And that's how the, the, the plot will look like. So these three patients here are lost. But I know that nothing happened until censoring. Uh, so the, 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 in the data structure, let's see, maybe I can, I can show you, uh, there are, there are two, two variables then. One is TI, which is the time at the last disease-free observation or time at event. And then the censoring variable CI, which is one if had the event, which is zero if there was no event at the time, at the time TI. So for example, you know, uh, this is a retrospective study of 13 women who had surgery for breast cancer, okay? And then we look at the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, I think it's survival, this one, it should be, uh, yeah, it should, should be survival as a function of the, of the time. And uh, sorry. And uh, uh, the survival times, you see, these are the different patients. These are the survival times. This is in arbitrary units, really, Ho hopefully. <laughs> it's 23, 47, 69, 70 plus. Plus means that that particular patient was censored at that point. So you see the, 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 the sensor here is one, the, the sensor parameter here is one, 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 zero, 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 because here the, the patient is censored, and then again, one, one. Now, how do we, do we calculate this, this, uh, this survival curve? There are three functions that are really important here. One is the uh, cumulative survival function, which is the proportion that survive until time t. FT is the frequency distribution of age at death, and HT is the hazard function. We will, we will come back to the hazard function uh, uh, later. It's essentially the death rate uh, at age T. So generally speaking, the, of course, the, the FT, the frequency distribution, uh, is the, the first derivative of the cumulative survival function. So this is a cumulative function, and this is the derivative, the survival, of the cumulative function will be the integral between t and plus infinite of uh, ft in dt or f, uh, fu in du, because this is from t to plus infinite, and can also be written in this way as e to minus the integral between zero and t of hu, the hazard function, where the hazard function here, you see, is, is uh, is uh, uh, is uh, can be described with the with the bias uh, with the bias statistics. I hope you are familiar with the bias statistics. So it's the limit per delta t that goes to zero of the probability that uh, uh, that the the, the 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 time t is between t and t plus the t under the condition that t is smaller than t. Uh, divided by by uh, by delta t. 
And then it can be easily shown that this is nothing else than the ratio of ft divided by st. Uh, and that's why you can write it in this way, or is the first derivative of the logarithm of st. So the, the probability distribution function ft, which is the probability that t is smaller than t, is defined in this way. The density function is this one, and the survival function can also be written in this way. Now, the, 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 by far the most... Uh, 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 use the uh, survival analysis uh, method uh, is called Kaplan-Meier by the name of the two statisticians that uh, uh, invented this method. It's very, it's very simple. It's a non-parametric estimate of the survival function. So the, the big advantage is that it's a non-parametric approach. So it, it, it does not depend on any model. Uh, it's commonly used to describe survivorship, as I said, uh, or especially, which is for us particularly important, to compare two study populations, populations treated with the drug, population treated with placebo. These days, you, you know, you can say even better because you have seen it on TV all the time, patients receiving vaccination for COVID-19 versus patients receiving placebo. Uh, this test uh, was necessary for Pfizer, for AstraZeneca, for Moderna, for all the companies to get the approval of the of the uh, of the either the FDA in US of the uh, of the uh, the, um, uh, the European uh, AMA, I think it's called, uh, to be uh, without this test and without the statistical analysis provided to the Commission, uh, it will would have never been approved for general use in the population. It's also very easy. Well, if you look at the plot, at the Kaplan-Meier plot, you immediately get the, the main point. So how do you create the Kaplan-Meier curve? It's actually, <laughs> it seems to be complicated, but it's actually it's not so complicated as, uh, uh, as it looks like. I mean, uh, first of all, you have to take all non-censored failure times. So the important thing is that you report the censoring points, uh, but what enters in the formula is only the non-censored uh, times. And then if NJ is the number of at risk, so the number of patients uh, still alive, for example, a time tj and dj is the number of deaths between t tj to minus one and tj in this interval then the fraction nj minus dj divided by nj is the probability of surviving past tj minus one uh, and which means of course it it it, it, it can be written in in, in this uh, bias uh, formulation and the, 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 the survival eventually can be, which is the probability that T is, is greater than T, we, we, have, we have seen this before, would be the product, the product of all this, this um, surviving probability from the time J, this is of course uh, at, at this time T, which corresponds to J intervals, from the time, from the interval J, from the Jism interval to the first interval. The product of this probability will give you the survival. It's, as I said, this more is easier than it looks like. I will show you some some examples in a uh, in a in a few slides. These are easy examples. You see, this is the beginning of the study. For example. Uh, randomized clinical trials for vaccination using Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine. Then you have five subjects. Uh, two subject, two subject A drops out after six months. Uh, subject C dies at seven months. I mean, maybe vaccine is not a good example. Let's say that we are talking about a drug for cancer therapy, so that it is possible that this subject dies. And here, subject E dies at four months. You see, so these are X. So these are times that are counted in the Kaplan-Meier. This is a censoring. And uh, uh, B and D survive for the whole period, which means that they are censored only here, essentially. At the end, th this is a censoring time, but it's a censoring time because they survived for the whole time. So this would be the corresponding uh, 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 
uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, you see? It is essentially given by, you start from 100%, uh, then you go down uh, because one subject, uh, one subject uh, uh, died. Then there is a censoring point here that is not affecting the, the curve. Though. You see the probability drops, another death, the probability drops, but then you have two patients that survive. So there is a, a straight line here, essentially censoring will be here and these patients, these patients survive. Now the, the probability, as I told you before, the probability of survival total will be the product of PA and PB, okay? And in this specific case, if you look, if you look at, the, at, the, at the data, we had uh, five patients. So the, for the first interval, it's four divided by five. And for the second interval, when you also have one patient censored, so you only have three at risk, you will have two divided by three. Uh, and this means that this survival is, point five, uh, point, is, is point 0.53. Okay, I think it's very easy. You only have to remember not to count the censoring in the, in the, in the calculation, but to show the censoring in the plot. Now, the probability of surviving in the entire year, taking into account the censoring, is called the product limit uh, estimate, which is 53%. Um, it is uh, uh, greater than 40% will be two out of five because the one dropout survived at least a portion of the year. So it's not, it's not counted. But it's less than 60%, which will be three divided by five because we don't know if the one dropout will have survived until the end of the year. So you see that the censoring is completely excluded from the calculation and then if your, if your first idea looking at the number was, uh, oh, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's two divided by five because two of them survived, or it's three divided by five because one, two, three survived, they're both wrong because two divided by five would include this one as a survivor, the, 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 the subject A, and, and three divided by five, sorry, three divided by five would include this one as survivor, and two divided by five would assume that this patient died. So, so that's, that's essentially how, how it looks like. Going back now to the example of the 45 women who had surgery for breast cancer, and these are the, 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 the survival times, you see, considering the, the, the censoring, this is how the Kaplan-Meier curve will look like, and the survival, the final, the 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 the, the limit estimate of the of the survival will be uh, zero point fifty one in the in the time interval. And that's and that's you see another another way to 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 uh, plot it. More examples, you see here, you have. A, you, you, you can have many examples. You can have more than uh, than than one curve. Um, this is a clinical trial where you see you have three survival curves from the day since uh, uh, hospitalization, and you have three samples now. Uh, this one that has no no treatment, and then two different treatments here. And you see that the Kaplan-Meier curve are also very easy to understand. You see at the beginning. Uh, even there was even more death here than here. And then at the end, both these two treatments do better than, than this one. And you can see graphically also what is the uh, limit survival within the time that, you, that your study is running. So for the, for the compare, of course, if you want to compare now statistics, the, the fact that the two curves look uh, different, you know, if you, if you look at this uh, at this uh, plot, uh, the two curves look look different. But looking different, as you know from uh, uh, hypothesis testing, does not mean that they are different. To prove that they are different, you you should use a test, and uh, a popular test is the, is the, is the so-called uh, log rank test. The log rank test uh, tests the null hypothesis of so no different. 
between survival function uh, of, the, uh, of the two groups. So how it looks like, essentially, the, 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 if you are familiar with the, uh, with the uh, Pearson uh, uh, chi-square test, the log rank test is an extension, uh, is a mantel hansel test in hypothesis testing. How it works? If we have only two groups uh, with the different treatments, uh, then we can represent them, you see, in a, in a, in a, in a two by two table. You see, like this one is the event and no event, or this one is the number at risk, and this one is, uh, is, the, uh, is the number of events. So if you define the quantity O minus E as uh, observed minus expected, this is nothing else than a typical, a typical um, uh, chi-square test where expected will be given by this formula or is simply, let's say, if you want the, the type of control, and this one will be the variance of the, uh, of the, uh, of the distribution. You see, so the observed minus expected will be given by minus 2.33 and the variance is 20. So uh, if the data are given through the time, then for every point in time, uh, you will have a two, type, uh, a two times two table. So if the two groups were the same, what would be the expected number of, of events? Will be always observed minus expected. And this is a measure of deviation of one treatment from, from the average, which is the expected. Uh, the log rank statistics measure whether the data in the two groups are effectively different. So, uh, again, uh, the null hypothesis is the, that survival are the same, and the most used test is the log rank, which is nothing else, if you're familiar with the chi-square, is a mantel hensel test because it's a, a multidimensional chi-square. Uh, but you can also use Wilcoxon test, which is a typical ranking test, or the likelihood ratio test. I hope you're familiar with this uh, uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, so when you have many groups, uh, the, the null hypothesis is that all survival curves are the same and the log uh, rank statistics can be, can be given, can be written in this way. Again, is nothing else than a, uh, than a multidimensional uh, uh, chi-square with, uh, um, with the degrees of freedom given by the number of groups minus one. Uh, that's, you know, how the, 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 the curves in Kaplan-Meier will look like. And this is an example again of the, this is the number of patients um, uh, N1, and this is the number of patients uh, N2. And now these are the events at different times occurring in the group one and in the group two. And now you will have, of course, you see the observed main minus expected uh, function here, going, going, uh, uh, going point by point here. You to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 19 because you have lost two patients and, and then uh, the, 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 this is now, now changing here and you will have different values of observed minus expected to calculate here, um, and which means that eventually you will end up with the uh, log rank uh, statistics of uh, uh, 16.7929. Uh, and uh, now you can use the chi-square tables, considering the, the number of degrees of freedom here, which is uh, just uh, one. Uh, and you look at the chi-square and you find that the, the probability is 0 0.00004, uh, which means that is less than 1%, and then uh, it's less than 5%, which is uh, statistically significant and even less than 1%, which is 
highly statistically significant, then you, you can conclude that the two groups are actually different using, using this system. And that's another, and that's another uh, way to uh, uh, report the, the data, giving you the, the uh, survival uh, ratio. Uh, let's go back now to the hazard function. The, 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 the curve you see of the hazard fraction as a function of the age uh, is not really a survival curve here, you see. This, this gives you the probability that you will die in the next interval. So, it, and you see, of course, as, as everybody knows, uh, the risk becomes much, much higher when you start to be older than 50. And then here it becomes a, a almost one. I mean, it's a, the, the, when, you go, when you go to this, to this very high age. So the, the concept here is that it's called the hazard function because it really gives you the risk at the given time that that event will occur. So this is an instantaneous incidence rate. And the, the, the definition I told you is given by this bias, uh, uh, by this bias formula. And is the probability that if you survive uh, until T, you will succumb to the event in the next instant, in the next time interval, if you want. So that uh, is the probability of surviving uh, in this time uh, interval assuming the t is greater than, than t divided by delta t. Uh, the point hazard function, which is of course not something you can measure, you can only calculate it, will be the limit where delta t get, goes to zero of this, uh, of this probability. So, uh, and it, it, it can be derived, of course, this is the derivation you see from the, from the, from the bias rule. You can actually, if, they, if this probability, can be written according according to to bias uh, uh, in uh, in this way, which means again that you can write it simply at this ratio, which is nothing else than ft dt divided by st. So essentially, is the is the uh, density function divided by the uh, survival function. Uh, the, 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 the difference between uh, hazard function and density function, uh, it, it can be a little bit uh, unclear, but just to make sure, when you are born, you have a certain probability of dying at any age. That's a probability density. It's, it's also called a marginal probability. You know? So a woman born today has, let's say, a 1% chance of dying at 80 years. This is something you can, you, you, you can calculate. However, if you survive for a while, your probability keep changing. So it's a conditional probability. That's why you need a bias, a bias formulation. For example, a woman who is 79 today will have a 5% chance of dying at 80 years. So now it's, a, it's the probability to die in the next interval. That's why, of course, the older you are, uh, there is a tendency to increase it every time. Uh, now, the, the, it, the, to calculate the Hazard function, you have to wonder what is the, the probability density function. And uh, um, so what is the probability density, which is, uh, you know, typically we say, okay, it should be Gaussian, you know, the probability density should be Gaussian. Uh, so for example, let's say the times to complete a midterm exam, not necessarily death. You see here, the event is the completion of the midterm exam. This generally follows a normal curve. If you take an average class, uh, this will follow an, a, a, Gaussian, a Gaussian distribution. So what is your probability of finishing at any given time given that you are still working on it. That's what the hazard function will say, not the general distribution of the probability of when it is completed, in how many months. But since I'm studying since five months, what's the probability that I will complete it in the next month? That's what the hazard function is, is telling us. So uh, these are examples, you see, of different uh, uh, probability 
density functions given here. Uh, these are cumulative distribution function for the different kind of, of curves with different sigma given here. And this is how the hazard function will, uh, will look like in this case. So the hazard function you see for, for the uh, very um, small sigma will be more steep than the hazard function for the larger sigma. So the, if you have a, a very broad distribution, your hazard function will be less steep. But you see that in any case, the hazard function has this characteristic following the, the cumulative distribu distribution function. You see, this one is directly calculated from, uh, from this one and is much more steep if you have, uh, if you have a, a, a small sigma. And this means that the hazard function will go up much more drastically. What is interesting though, you see the hazard function always starts low and then increase. So um, if we have a constant hazard function, ht equal to, to h, uh, this should correspond to an exponential density function, h e to minus ht, uh, and the survival function will be uh, e to minus ht. So for a constant, this is how, how we we, we, we have derived the, the hazard function and, uh, and the survival function. So if you have a constant hazard function, which is as we have seen is not the case for the normal uh, survival for the general population, but if it is constant, the hazard function. So if the, if the probability that you get uh, uh, the exam, for example, next month uh, is the same uh, independently from how many, how many uh, months you are studying. Say that uh, you have a bad professor who essentially he doesn't look at whether you are prepared or not. He gives you the exam randomly. You know, he toss a coin. Then the hazard function will be will be essentially 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 uh, constant, and the survival function will look like e to minus h t. And uh, this is exactly what will give you the uh, the the um, uh, survival the exponential survival curve that we have seen in uh, in uh, the Huygens study so in Huygens study you see the 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 hazard function at that time was almost constant and this gives you an exponential survival curve which is not the case today uh, you see that the, 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 at that time, of course, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, mortality in the young age, which is now not existing anymore. Nobody dies, you know, in the, in the except for very few, fortunately, uh, in the childhood and in the, in the adolescence. You know, you start to die only after 50. So the Hazard function is not constant and the survival curve is not exponential. But at that time, it was essentially exponential. You see, the probability of living over 76 years was only 1%. More than 36 years was only 16%. More than 20 years was only 20%. So it's incredible. In, two cent in, in three centuries, I would say almost, uh, how the survival curves have completely changed now. Good. So um, try to describe this in exponentially probability functions, and this is how is this drawn, and, and then you will have, as I told you, the the the, the formulas that that I've shown you before. And this is okay. This is again the the, the full calculation of the of the of the Hazard functions now. Uh, based uh, on the on on this uh, on this uh, uh, on this formula, and then the, then the Hazard is constant, as I said, and is uh, uh, five percent. The Hazard function at that time was five percent and was constant. The so if you take the survival uh, curve now, it will look much more like almost constant here, and then dropping down this way and going eventually to zero but we, we the scale that extend to 100 years, not, not to uh, 70 or, or 80 years. And not 
decrying exponentially, but being very, is almost like a sigmoid, the, the current survival curve, you know, almost constant here, then drops and then here. So I'm sorry, I will, uh, I, I will show you one when we have our, our uh, question and answer uh, time. And then in general, of course, uh, if the hazard is constant and is 5%, you can calculate the probability to survive at any age, simply like e to minus, uh, uh, minus, e to minus 0.05 times the age. <coughs> so this is just a, 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 for your memory, let's say to remember the definitions of the uh, of the um, how can you derive if you want uh, the different function you see the hazard function the survival density how you derive the density from survival the density from hazard the survival from hazard and the hazard from from survival um, to get to survival from a time dependent now if instead your uh, uh, hazard which is more realistic is not uh, is not uh, um, uh, constant, but is time dependent. You see, it's increasing with time. For example, is 0.01 times t, so that you see h10 will be 0.1. This is only an example. Then you can actually calculate the survival directly from hazard. So survival will be uh, will be given by this formula, and then you can calculate it uh, uh, knowing what is the the, the the shape of the of the hazard function. Now, the important thing in the hazard analysis uh, is the Cox regression. Uh, Cox regression is a semi-parametric method, um, models the effect of predictor and covariates on the hazard rates, but leaves the baseland hazard rate unspecified. So this is useful because if you don't know the hazard rate, the baseline one, you can still use the Cox model to uh, predict whether one uh, treatment, like one drug or one radiotherapy, whatever, is affecting the hazard rate. Uh, does not so no knowledge of absolute risk, and it's always estimate relative rather, rather than, than absolute risk. So the, the model is given by, by, by this Cox regression uh, formula. Uh, the baseline hazard function, which is left unspecified, must be positive. And the linear function of a set of k fixed covariates is, is exponential. So the idea of the, of, the, of the Cox regression is that uh, the, the, the logarithm, it's a, it's a logarithm expansion. Let's say the logarithm of hit is the logarithm of the baseline plus uh, beta one xi one plus uh, uh, B, uh, beta k xi k, which of course uh, uh, can be written in, the, uh, in exponential form here. Now the, the, the proportional, now the proportional hazard, that's the only thing we care. We don't care on the absolute risk. We only care about the relative risk. So we have a ratio of uh, of uh, two uh, hazard H1 and H2. And this is independent of the baseline the hazard function. And this is simply the exponential of beta X1 minus X2. So that's the basis of the, of the, of the Cox hazard. And uh, um, now the Cox proportional hazard assume multiplicative risk. So this is the proportional hazard assumption is conveniently separates baseline hazard from covariates. This is something I already told you, is non-parametric, can handle both, co uh, both uh, uh, continuous and categorical predictor variables. And uh, uh, without knowing the baseline hazard can still quite calculate the, the hazard ratio, which is what we really care about. The, limit, the limitations is that, of course, the covariates normally do not vary over time, um, even though one can program time-dependent variables. The baseline hazard function is never specified. And you can estimate H0 accurately 
um, if you need to estimate the survival function, not only the, 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 the ratio. So the, the, the hazard ratio eventually will be written in, 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 in this way. Uh, now, uh, what is the meaning? I mean, let's say that the hazard ratio is 0 0.7, then the relative effect on survival is 30%, one minus HR. So you have a 30% reduction of the risk of death. That's the meaning, you know, an hazard ratio of 0 0.7 means that you have a 30% reduction in the risk of death. So you can understand that that's, uh, sometimes this is what you want to know in a, in a, in a, um, in a clinical trial, especially when you want to analyze every component separately in the, in the, in the clinical trial. And of course, you can calculate the absolute difference in survival and the difference in median survival. So what is the, 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 uh, the median survival the, at, at the time where 50% of the patients have, uh, have, uh, have um, under, underwent the event, died, let's say. Um, so, so you see, you can calculate the, uh, if, the, if the median, for example, is 25 months, so half of the patients uh, are uh, um, experienced the event within 25 months, uh, uh, then using the, 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 the hazard ratio, you find that uh, if the hazard ratio is 70% is, uh, you gain uh, 10 months, 10.7 months survival in addition if you, if you have an hazard ratio of 70%. Now, let me give you some, some, some example. This is, by the way, uh, a very well-known clinical trial uh, Fund, funded by AstraZeneca, which is now a very well-known company, uh, because AstraZeneca also produce uh, these uh, uh, immunotherapy drugs. Uh, in particular, it's uh, uh, Durvalumab, is an uh, immunotherapy uh, drug. And in this particular trial, this drug was used in combination with uh, uh, radiotherapy in stage three, uh, no small cell lung cancer. Stage three means that the patients are not metastatic, but the tumor is locally invasive. So generally it's inoperable. So you have to use a combination of chemotherapy, immunotherapy here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, drugs. You see that the conclusion is that the progression-free survival, and also we will see overall survival, progression-free survival means uh, the survival, the time, to the progression of the tumor. So you treat, the tumor is not progressing anymore, stops. And then you calculate your progression, uh, your, uh, um, the, the time that it takes for you, for the tumor to go back to growth. Of course, this can be uh, infinite, <laughs> you know, that, that it does not go back to progression. The other quantity is the overall survival. Now, generally, Overall, the progression-free survival is a measurement of the local effect of the treatment. The overall survival is a measurement of the, uh, of the uh, systemic effect because you can have no progression, but still you die because of distal metastasis. So if this is now how it looks like, you see, this is now the curve uh, for progression-free survival as a function of the months after, 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 uh, uh, after randomization. And uh, the blue curve are patients receiving radiotherapy and uh, durvalumab. The yellow curve are patients receiving um, uh, radiotherapy and placebo. So you immediately see, that's the nice thing of, and you see many patients are censored here. These are all censored patients. Um, now, the point uh, is that you see already visually that the treatment was effective. It, these are the real number. I mean, these are the number of patients uh, uh, initially treated with, uh, uh, with Durvalumab, and these are the number of patients treated with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with placebo. You see, it's, uh, this is the total number of events observed in the events means uh, progression here, not death, only, only, only progression. 
And this is, you see, the median progression free, uh, the median progression free survival and 95% confidence interval, all things I hope are familiar, 16 months, 17 months were for Gruvalumab, only six months for, for placebo, the 12 months progression free survival and the 18 months progression free survival. You see 50, 55%, 44%, eventually 27% only had no progression after uh, one year and a half, but almost half of the patient had no progression after one year and a half uh, when treated with, with Durbalumab. Uh, the, the, the hazard ratio, that's, that's how, that why is interesting. The hazard ratio for disease progression or death, because of course the, here you also include patient that died, was uh, uh, 0 0.52, 52%. It uh, was 0 0.52. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite low. We, we made an example before of how the hazard ratio uh, uh, was uh, uh, 0 0.7. What happens if the hazard ratio was 0 0.7? Here is uh, 0 0.52 based on this data, which means uh, that the difference is statistically significant. You see a two-sided is a P is less than, is, uh, is less than 1%. Uh, this trial changed the clinical practice from day to night. Essentially, the following day that this paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the standard of treatment for uh, stage three locally advanced lung cancer became radiotherapy plus durbalumab. Unfortunately, as you see here, the situation is a little bit worse when you take the, 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 overall, uh, the, the overall survival. You see that uh, uh, still patient, this because of distal metastasis. Uh, still, you have better, the patients are better off uh, when uh, they are treated with Durvalumab than with placebo, but the difference is smaller. This is clearly visual here, and if you look at the number, and the hazard ratio now is not anymore 50%, uh, but is almost 70%, still is uh, um, significant at, um, uh, because you see the probability is 0 0.0025, so it's still less than one than one percent. So it's still statistically significant uh, improvement. Very interesting here is that then at this point you can start to analyze uh, uh, the 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 different categories of patients. You see here the patients are divided for uh, sex, uh, age, smoking status. Uh, uh, stage, whether it's 3A or 3B, a little bit more advanced, a little bit less advanced. And so the EGFR mutation, which is, uh, which is a biomarker of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the disease. And, uh, uh, and this is very interesting, you see, because it's, uh, it shows you here, you can calculate the hazard ratio for every one of, uh, uh, of these parameters. And you see that they are always favorable. You see the hazard ratio is, is always less than one. So the hazard ratio is always H1 divided by H2. So you always have, uh, it should be less than one to have uh, that your treatment is effective. It's always less than one. And is it particularly in interesting here if you look at the, the uh, PDL1 status, uh, which is actually less than, you see, is, is significantly less than one when uh, the PDL1 status is very important because uh, the immunotherapy is an anti-PDL1. So if the tumor is not expressing the PDL1, you don't expect uh, to, be, to, be, uh, to be significant. And in fact, uh, you see it here when the expression of PDL1 is less than 1%, uh, now there is essentially no difference. The hazard ratio is 1.36. So Durvalumab is not working. So the the assessment of the PDL1 status is clearly a biomarker on whether you should use Durvalumab or not, done with the Cox regression analysis. Okay, the final uh, point that I want to touch now briefly is uh, how to design a clinical trial. So, how can you design a clinical trial based on this statistical consideration? So, generally speaking, you, the, the clinical trial you have probably now learned from the vaccine 
Every clinical trial has three phases. Uh, phase one, which is generally few uh, participants, few volunteers, uh, this is only a safety test. Phase two is a dose escalation test. So you, you escalate the dose until you get it optimal. And phase three, where you really need large cohort uh, in the vaccine, you had phase three trials with 20,000 participants, uh, is a comparative trial. At that point, you have the review from the FDA. This slide is uh, uh, American. Uh, in Europe, there is the uh, European uh, Agency of Drugs. Uh, and then you have the phase four. The phase four, the phase four is the follow-up trial. So you, you, you continue to check on, your, uh, on the patients that receive that drug uh, and continue to report to see the real long-term effectiveness of that drug or the vaccine. So how do you decide? You see, the, the randomized clinical trial, the phase three, uh, phase three is randomized clinical trial. Essentially, you uh, randomly assign a patient to the intervention, vaccination, for example, or control, injection of placebo. And then you look at disease and disease-free. Uh, or you can have uh, uh, treatment and control cured, not cured. Or you can have treatment and control, dead alive, dead alive. You can, you can have different endpoints in your, in, your, in your clinical trial. In a cohort study that can be prospective, but can also be retrospective. So you only take the old data and then you do the cohort study. You look at the exposed, the cohort studies are generally for, for, for ecology and unexposed. And then you look at disease or disease free. Say that you want to have a cohort study to see whether a certain petrol is carcinogenic, then you take the population exposed, those that are unexposed, and then you look at disease or disease free. Now, so you need a lot of information to decide your clinical trial. You know, that's a list from the primary endpoints, for example, overall survival, secondary endpoint, for example, progression free survival. Exploratory objects, for example, quality of life, this can be very important because maybe uh, you have a drug for cancer where it doesn't change the survival. You have the same survival, but the quality of life is much better. Uh, then it's useful, you know, because it's, uh, it's, much, it's much nicer, I mean, to have your last months or years of life with a good quality of life. There are, then you have to decide the eligibility criteria. So which patients can be enrolled, the exclusion criteria, the number of arms, so how many treatments in addition to, to, to control you want, the protocol for treatment and for adverse reaction scoring. You are, I think you are familiar from the vaccine now. The follow-up plan, very important, uh, and, uh, and the forms. So the, the, the problem is that how do you calculate the, uh, the sample size? How many patients I need to enroll to give a final answer, this is effective or is not effective. So first you have to decide which test you want to do. You know, it goes from T-test, Z-test, uh, log rank, you know, chi-square, exact test, whatever. The number of tails. So you, only if you want to see uh, that one is superior to the other, for example. And then you have to decide your alpha value. Sorry, this is alpha, it's not A. And the power, the one minus beta. Uh, the allocation ratio, how many, how many patients in one group and how many patients in the other group. And the effect size. So what do you expect? Do you expect a large difference or do you expect a small difference? That's very important. Uh, the, 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 the effect size different family, this is an, uh, the, this one, of course, the, the average minus the standard deviation uh, here, where the standard deviation is a combined standard deviation of the two, is an unbiased estimator of the effect size. You know, tells you this is a big effect, this is a small effect. If D is small and if D is big. Um, now, the, 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 for the correlation families used for paired quantitative data, 
is based on the coefficient of, of determination R square, which is just the square of the Pearson correlation coefficient, and is used in trials and experiment where there is an expected correlation between variables. For example, birth weight and longevity. So if you, if you have a trial on, uh, uh, on a drug affecting birth weight and you look at, at, at longevity, you know that there is a there is a correlation between the variables, and then you can use uh, this uh, uh, coefficient of determination. Uh, this this uh, uh, D, now the effect size, uh, say using D, uh, is divided in very small, small, medium, large, very large, and huge, uh, depending on the D value. This is the so called Cohen Savilovsky scale uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, up to 2, that is very large effect expected. So an example, for example, now, uh, this is a, a clinical trial that I, I contributed to design. It's called Cypher. This is a prospective multicenter. So prospective means uh, I start to enroll the patients after deciding to start the trial. Multicenter means that the patients are not treated, all of them in the same hospital. Randomized, so patients are assigned to the two treatments randomly. Phase three, because it's a comparative trial of carbon ion versus conventional photon radiation therapy for locally advanced unresectable pancreatic cancer. If you remember, one of the most interesting uh, candidates for good effects of carbon ions. What is the idea? The idea is that you have two arms here. One is uh, carbon ions, and the second is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, photon therapy. Uh, induction uh, chemotherapy means that you treat the patients with chemotherapy before radiotherapy. Um, eligibility criteria are, are, are given here. And the study design, uh, if you do the statistics at this point, you can find out that if you have 38 patients, 19 in each arm, you have an 80% power, so B-20%, to detect an improvement in overall survival at two years from 10 to 40%. Two-sided significance level, alpha equal, uh, equal 10%. So you see the, 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 the effect size is very important. Here, you, 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 if the effect size is quite big here, you see you go from 10 to 40% overall survival at two years, then 38 patients will give you the answer with a confidence uh, of 10% and the power of text will be 80%. So which is uh, the probability alpha, of, if you remember, is the, is the, is the probability of a uh, type one error and beta is the probability of type two error from, from uh, hypothesis, uh, from hypothesis testing. So you want uh, uh, one minus beta to be as high as possible and alpha to be as low as possible, but generally uh, people agree on 10% uh, uh, alpha and 80% uh, one minus beta. Uh, okay, this was only you know to, to show you the the final uh, the description of the uh, statistical analysis in the Pacific trial. You see, uh, the study was uh, to be considered positive. If either of the two comprimary endpoints, progression free or overall survival, was significantly longer with Durvalumab than with, than, uh, than with placebo. And they decided to enroll 700 patients for two to one randomization to obtain the 45, uh, 458 progression free survival events for the primary analysis and 40, 491 overall survival events. It was estimated that the study will have 95% or greater power. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, low beta value here to detect a hazard ratio. So they, they, they used the hazard ratio for disease uh, progression or death of 0 0.67 and the 85% or greater power to detect the hazard ratio for death of uh, uh, 0 0.73. So you see, this would be this would have been good. This would have been not so good. Actually, they got 0 
on the basis of a log rank test. So you have to say which test you used with a two side significance level of 2.5% for each comprimary endpoint. And uh, just to tell you the final is that if you want to do this calculation, there's a very nice free uh, software available, which is called GPower. And you can, it's actually a German software. So you, you can download it from this site and you can play with it if you want to design a clean up. With this, we, we can conclude. Thank you very much.